السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. Let's try this again. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل أخطة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم آمين I'd like to start off by welcoming everyone to tonight's very special program inshallah ta'ala um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Adam Center uh, Tonight, actually, we are very, every night, the Kurtab Institute, which is the educational wing here at the Adams Center, has classes at 7 o'clock every night. And especially on Friday nights, there's a, usually a nice crowd for Imam Majid's community class. Uh, this month, we have a series of guest lecturers. And I just wanted to draw attention. This is a bit of an eye so I apologize for that now. But we have uh, Kurtaba Institute's March Madness which is really a series of educational seminars and programs that will be taking place throughout the month of March. So inshallah, look forward to it in your email and you'll get information. Tonight is the first special program that we have, uh, Peace Through Beautiful Resistance with Dr. Abdul Fattah Abu Sarur. Uh, on, I, I will introduce shortly inshallah. And then we have special classes on Monday and Wednesday of next week. Sister Salma Bujjeri will be doing a class on spirituality and family. And Dr. Alta Hussein will be doing a class on social justice on Wednesday. Inshallah, the following weekend, not next weekend, but the following weekend, we have a very special guest, Sheikh Ubaidullah Evans from the Alam Program. From the Alam Program, the American Learning Institute for Muslims. He will be doing a seminar here at the Adams Center on contemporary American Muslim issues. Contemporary issues, things that we are facing every day in our lives and how we can overcome them or understand them from the perspective of Maqasid al-Sharia and Usul al-Fiqh. So inshallah that will be in, uh, in Saturday, March 22nd and 24th, uh, 20, 23rd, and then the 24th and 26th, Dr. Tariq al-Ghafri will be doing a special class on the status of the Prophet like I said, it's all it's a bit of an eyesore, but inshallah, uh, you'll see this in your email. We encourage you to come and bring your families throughout the month of March for special programming. On top of that, Sheikh Abdul Rafa will continue teaching his introduction to Qawaiyat Fiqhiyah class on Tuesday nights, and Imam Majid will be teaching his regularly scheduled classes the nights so that we don't have a special program. Okay? If you need more information about that, feel free to see myself or any of the courtable volunteers, and we will be more than happy uh, to help you with that. Now, I'll turn to the attention to tonight's very special program. Um, we had actually an opportunity, there was a group of, of people from the Adam Center and the community who had an opportunity to visit and to go to uh, Aida refugee camp outside of Bethlehem in Philistine. And we worked actually at a school that was in that, uh, in that refugee camp that was started by Dr. Abdul Fattah. I wanted to just have uh, a couple of representatives, I believe they're here from United Muslim Relief, talk a little bit about what their volunteer abroad program is. Oftentimes, these are the types of programs that many people in the community don't know about, and we think they're of, of significant benefit. So if I could ask uh, Iman to just come and say a few words of trouble. Whatever, I'm just going to hold this. Sorry, I'm everyone. Uh, my name is Iman. I actually traveled with Shed um, and some people from Adam Center to the Arouet, um School. But before we, um, well, before we talk about that, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about United Muslim Relief. Um, United Muslim Relief was originally known as Muslims Without Borders. I don't know if you've heard of that name before, but we started in 2010 after um, the earthquake in Haiti. And since then, it's sort of kicked off. and it's. Um, it started off as relief mission trips, and then it started out as chapters in different uh, universities. And right now, I believe we have about like 11 or 12 chapters around the United States, and we do different things. I mean, we do things locally, like Project Downtown, or um, Kicks for Kids, like soccer for kids and stuff, and we also do abroad things as well. Um, I'm not part of United Muslim Relief General, but my partner, Fayouz and I, we run um, UMR Volunteer Abroad, which is what um, Shed went on the trip with. Um, so, 
In UMR Volunteer Abroad, so far we've been to about five different countries. We've been to Mexico before, we've been to Palestine, we've been to Haiti. Um, inshallah, inshallah, we'd like to go to Senegal, and inshallah, in the future, we'd like to go to Malaysia. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about each trip, and if you're interested about knowing more or specifically interested in one trip, you're welcome to talk to us. Me and Fidus are going to be sitting outside. Um, so our first trip, Mexico, we usually go there every six months. It's an all-girls trip. Um, our upcoming trip is going to be from June 2nd to 11th, uh, 2014, so really, really soon, inshallah. And we volunteer in an orphanage there. Um, there's about 32 kids over there. They're all um, low socioeconomic class. Some of them are orphans. Some of them actually aren't, but they've been, you know, had a history of abuse in their lives. And what we do is we go there and we do physical projects for them, like gardening or painting or whatever. And then depending on the volunteers that are there, we offer workshops for the kids as well, depending on the background of the kids. So that's Mexico. Um, we also go to Palestine. We just came back from Palestine in uh, January, and this was a boys and girls trip. Um, I believe our next trip is going to be winter of 2015, so in one year, inshallah. In this one, we volunteered at the Arwed um, Cultural School, which Dr. Abdifika will be speaking about, so I don't want to go into too much um, detail. But um, that is a boys and girls trip, so if you're interested as well, you can sign up for that. Um, in addition to Palestine, we also have Senegal that's coming up. It's coming up this summer. It's going to be a boys and girls trip as well from June 15th to 27th. We're going to be volunteering in uh, Miraguan, Haiti, um, mostly building wells and renovating schools and teaching kids. Um, Inshallah, in the future, we'd like to go to Malaysia, and that's going to be an autism school, an autistic school. So that could be more geared towards people that have an education background. Um, the things that make our programs really special, because there's a lot of volunteer abroad programs around, the thing that makes our program special is that um, we like to go with a spiritual leader. So usually at the end of every day we kind of reconvene and we have a theme and we talk about what we did and you know kind of have a spiritual connection. But also um, our trips are comprised of us doing what they ask of us and then us also offering what we can give. So if they need painting, for example, we'll do that. But we offer skills based on what we know. So for example, I'm a teacher, I could offer a teaching workshop. Or if someone is a photographer, they could offer a photography workshop whatever the case is. Um, if, you want, if you need more information about what we do or where we go, you're welcome to visit the table outside. We also have more information about Arwed. We have information about um, the Central African Republic crisis if you'd like to learn more about that. And we also have some items out there for auction if you'd like to um, purchase those as well. So that's, that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Shaz. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. While they're setting up, inshallah, I just wanted to share a few words before turning it over to um, Dr. Abdul Fattah. Um, we had the distinct, obviously, as I mentioned, uh, you know, honor of traveling with this with this group to uh, Bethlehem and to this to the cultural center there. And I'll, I'll let the particulars and the details of it. Uh, I'll leave that to Dr. Abdul Fattah and inshallah to explain about not just the life over there uh, and, and some of the adversity that's faced with, but also as a reminder to all of us, there is adversity that we have at all points in our lives, right? And if you, you don't have to look any further than the lives of the prophets themselves, right? People would think that uh, Nuh alayhi salam was crazy because he was building a, an ark for a flood that was supposedly never going to come, right? We had Ibrahim alayhi salam thrown into the fire. We had Musa alayhi salam exiled. We had the Prophet ﷺ with deep tragedies, personal tragedies in his own life. And it's something that we highlighted earlier today in the khutbah, was about the manner in which they overcame this adversity, these Prophets. And they did that as an example to us. And it was through their example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fortified this deen. And really gave us inspiration. There's a famous story from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ that I shared with some of the kids this morning. Uh, in which after you know, the lowest moment of his life in Ta'if, after Ta'if, the Prophet ﷺ was at an orchard. He was basically camping out at that orchard because he had no way of getting back into Mecca. And there was a, a, a servant of none other than Al-Walid ibn Mughira. Al-Walid ibn Mughira was an enemy of the Prophet ﷺ. One of his servants found the Prophet at this orchard 
And at this point, he noticed that the Prophet was down. In fact, they even said that Al-Walid himself noticed that the Prophet ﷺ was hurt because of what had happened in Taif. And he was incredibly vulnerable at that moment. And what happened was that the, the boy, the child, he gave some grapes to the Prophet ﷺ. Before the Prophet ﷺ actually ate the grapes, he said, Bismillah. The boy himself was shocked. He said, wait. He said, I don't, people in this area, the Arabs in this, they don't say Bismillah. Where did you, where did you learn this Bismillah? And the Prophet ﷺ responded to him, where are you from? He asked the servant boy, where are you from? He said, I'm from Nineveh in Iraq, or what's modern day Iraq. The Prophet ﷺ said, oh, you're from the hometown of Yunus salam." The boy himself responded, less than 10 people from the town of Nineveh even know that Yunus was from Nineveh. How or is it that you have this knowledge? How do you know that he was from there? The Prophet ﷺ responded back to him and said, Yunus is my brother and I am his brother because we are both prophets of God. We are both prophets of God. At that moment, this Christian boy, he actually kissed the hands and the face of the Prophet ﷺ before going back to his master, Al-Walid ibn Mughira. You know, it's amazing when you look at this story, it's through the enemy of Islam that Allah is sending a sign to the Prophet ﷺ that he's on the straight path. That he should continue down the path that he's going. That he should continue doing what he's doing. It's through a sign of his enemy. And that child himself would later come and accept Islam because of this incident. So sometimes in the, in the depths of adversity, in the worst of places, we have greatness that rises. We have goodness that comes forth. Yunus السلام, himself was in the depth of a whale after being thrown overboard from a ship in the middle of an ocean. I mean, imagine that. The odds are completely against him. And yet uh, he, of all of the prophets, it's Yunus السلام, whose entire qawm accepted Islam after him. Most of the other qawms of the prophets, they were punished. Yunus السلام, that was not the case. In the depth of darkness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought forth light. And he did the same to the Prophet ﷺ. And inshallah ta'ala, he'll do the same for those who are undergoing adversity today. Dr. Abdul Fattah Abu Surur is actually, was actually born and raised in the Aida refugee camp. And it was through the camp and what he saw and the, the, the constant kind of violence that he experienced while he was there, he was able to obtain a scholarship to France and he came back and started a school for theater and the cultural arts at the Rawad Center. And myself and a number of others who are here in this crowd, we were able to visit that school and see the work that they're doing with the children. At this time, I would like to ask Dr. Abdul Fattah to speak and address to the crowd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. fikum. I am really very honored to be here and talking to you. My name is Abdel Fattah, Abdel Karim, Hassan, Ibrahim, Muhammad, Ahmed, Mustafa, Ibrahim, Surur, Abu Surur. <laughs> These are 10 generations, and I was the first to be born in a refugee camp called Aida. And for those who speak Arabic, Aida means the one who shall return. So for a refugee, it is really very symbolic because we have still these old rusty keys for doors that do or do not exist anymore reclaiming our right to return. And as Brother Shad said, I was one of the privileged to get a scholarship to continue my studies in France where I got my master and doctorate in biological and medical engineering. But my heart was also with theater, with painting, with photography. So it was a great opportunity to develop the artistic part, but also to discover who I was. At that time, in 1985, when I got my scholarship, we used to travel with an Israeli travel document at that time. We did not have Palestinian passports. And in these travel documents, the Israelis put us as nationality Jordanian. So when I went to do my residency card, 
the French police gave me a residency card with nationality, Jordanian refugee under Israeli mandate. So of course I was not very happy with that. And I said, I am a Palestinian under Israeli occupation. And after a big debate, okay, come back tomorrow, monsieur. And when I came back the next day, they gave me a residency card with nationality to be determined. So I guess the irony of it was Palestinians were famous as terrorists in the media, but as human beings to be determined. So that was the starting point of how to show this other image of Palestine, how to say that we are human beings, we reclaim and defend this humanity. And that's why nine years later, when I finished my studies, I came back to Palestine. I did not stay in France. I did not get married with a French woman. I did not ask for a French nationality. Because for us, we have a purpose. Coming, doing your education, come back, serve your country. All the Israeli policies was on ethnically cleansing Bush people to leave. So those who can come back, they should come back and continue existing on this land because it is an act of resistance. So finally, I arrived in 1994 back to Palestine. I started working with my biology degree to earn my living, but also volunteering to train theater and arts. Until 1998, where with a group of friends, I founded Ar-Ruwad. Ar-Ruwad in Arabic means the pioneers. And I started with theater because theater is one of the most amazing and powerful and civilized and non-violent ways to express yourself. Tell your story, your version of your story, without hypocrisy or worrying to be politically correct. But also it's a way to build the peace within before talking about peace with anybody else. Because if you are not truthful with yourself, I don't think you can be truthful with anybody. And if you are not in peace with yourself, how can you make peace with anybody? We are in Aida refugee camp, which is one of 59 refugee camps which were created after what we call our Nakba, or catastrophe, when two-thirds of Palestinians became refugees. 59 refugee camps were built on rented land, so we are not owners of the land. We are guests, and 66 years later, we are still guests and considering ourselves as guests. Aida is one of the three in Bethlehem, hosting about 6,000 people who originated from 41 different villages among 534 which were occupied and destroyed by Zionist groups. 66% of this population is under 18 years old. It's about 10 acres no playgrounds or green spaces surrounded by this illegal wall of separation since 2002 as barbed wires and then in 2005 with these blocks of cement that go from 6 to 12 meters high and five towers of snipers and cameras of surveillance and incursions by the Israeli army until today. And so with all of this, it's an environment where everything is boiling. And Added to that, about 70% of unemployment rate, which makes it harder for a lot of people. So in a space like this where despair comes rapidly and hope flies rapidly, how to give our children and young people the possibility to build this peace within and to grow up and stay alive? And to think that they can hopefully change the world and create miracles without need to carry a gun and shoot everybody else or explode themselves or burn themselves, but to stay alive. Because at the end of the day, we as parents, we as educators, we as human beings, we want to see our children grow up and we want to celebrate their life and their successes. And hopefully, when the time comes, they should be the ones walking in our funerals and not the other way around. So our responsibility to give them every possibility where their future would be better, where every day that comes should be more beautiful than the day that goes, and that we are the best role models for our children and the generations to come. And we should live out of our faith and out of our action 
that we are important individuals and that everybody of us is a human being who is a change maker and that change does not come from any other place if we are not actors of change. So that's why we started with theater, we added photography, video, we worked with kindergartens, with the school, with parents, we focused a lot on the work with women because it's the mother, it's the woman who changed the world, who raised the generations. And if she does not have also peace within her, then the whole family would be in trouble. So we added mobile beautiful resistance. What we are doing, I called it beautiful resistance against the ugliness of occupation and this violence. Started mobile beautiful, beautiful resistance, going to other refugee camps, villages, communities, and training the trainers as part of saying, despite the checkpoints, despite this illegal wall, we are not going to close ourselves in pento stands and say we can get used to it. Nobody can get used to occupation and oppression and say I am fine with it. And we toured internationally. We have been in France, in Belgium, in the United States, in Egypt. Touring internationally was a way to show our children what a normal life is in free countries without occupations. It was a way to connect with each other, to look at each other as equally human beings, to see that we have similarities and these similarities should bring us closer to each other. And that we have also differences. And these differences is, are an enrichment. as something that can enrich us and not marginalize us and make us afraid from each other. God, Allah created us different because it is an enrichment. To know each other, to mix with each other, to appreciate this difference in the most beautiful way. And that's why difference is an enrichment, and it is a beauty in our humanity. And so, with all these troubles, children, our children coming to the United States, coming to Louisville, Kentucky, sharing with Afro-American kids workshops and, and, and meals and so on, said at one time, these people are poorer than us. You can imagine children from a refugee camp in occupied Palestine coming to the United States, the biggest, richest country in the world, saying they are poorer than us. And that's why for me it's an act of saying that injustice is everywhere. And that we are equally human beings in challenging these injustices because every injustice concerns us as human beings wherever we live. And we cannot just say it's far away because it will knock at your door one of these days that as human beings we share the same values. We talk about justice, freedom, peace, equality, love. And these are values also that we share as human beings, whether we are Muslim or Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or Hindu or whatever we are. We are equally human beings and we share the same values which are not elastic. They don't change based on new realities on the ground or the dictation of this leader or that leader. This is the essence of our humanity. And so that's why I guess I quit my paying jobs in 2005. I was work teaching at Bethlehem University. I was teaching in Ramallah. I was working in a pharmaceutical company seven days a week, alhamdulillah. Because I believe that we can do better with education and culture than with my biology research and, and work. For the children of Palestine, but also the children of the world. And so we started working on building an infrastructure. In 1998, I started Arwad in my parents' house, in two small rooms. And I was today in the school Al-Fatih, and I saw the kids, and they have a similar story, beginning in a room also when they started here, almost in the same time. And we started saying, with or without money, we do it. With or without money, we do it was a way to say, that Palestinian cause is not a humanitarian cause. That Palestinians are not poor because they are lazy or don't have resources. Palestinians are put into the poverty by an illegal occupation, which deprives the people from the right to circulate freely, to import, to export, even to get married freely with whoever they want. With this segregation between Palestine 48, East Jerusalem, Gaza, the West Bank, and the world. 
So if people want to support Palestinians, it should not be an act of charity or pity because for me as a Palestinian, even as a refugee, this is more humiliating than the occupation itself. People should support us to help create jobs, build infrastructure, to create possibilities for people to remain and exist and resist and keep their dignity. And that's why I guess all the relations that we try to build is building these possibilities of partnerships. We work with kindergartens, with the schools to give possibilities. We work on trying to improve the way education is so that it cannot be just dictation and children have to memorize all the answers of the world. But they have to think, they have to be critical, they have to be creative and develop their imagination and creativity and not to transform them into robots who just know the answers of every question but don't know how to ask a question. And all the essence of Islam is this questioning, this quest to understand, to think, to question things and not just to take things as they are deafly, mutely, without any understanding of why we believe in God, why we have faith in God, why we adore God, why we practice our religion based on our faith in Allah. So that's why I guess all the work we try to do is building these possibilities for children. We have started a lot of pioneering programs which were the first of their kind in Palestine. Trying to work on our culture, our identity, trying to create games for children who have difficulties in learning, try to respond to the needs of the community. When there was incursions and curfews, Arwad shifted into an emergency medical clinic because until today, 66 years later after the creation of this refugee camp, there is no clinic in either refugee camp. And so we had to respond to our needs on our own. When there was curfews and incursions, the center shifted into an emergency medical clinic and a media center and the school when the schools were closed. And even recently with the strike of UNRWA employees, for more than two months, the schools were closed. The children were in the streets. So we had to act. And I say act and not react because we believe in action on the long term and not just reaction to a catastrophe or an emergency. So our world was open, hosting the children, continuing the program of their school education. Because we cannot just let our children stay in the streets and say we are fine with it. So that be they become just a number on a list of martyrs or handicapped for the rest of their lives or perish in Israeli prisons. We have to protect our children and give them every possibility so that they do not be just a victim or just in the street or think the only way to change anything is to carry a gun or explode themselves. Resistance is a legitimate right, don't take me wrong. But for children, it's important to save lives and give them possibilities that they can do better than killing themselves. Because no country in the world can to live on the corpses of its people. And even when they go and demonstrate against every injustice, and I believe that people has, have the right to resist and to uh, demonstrate against every injustice in the world. Hopefully, instead of saying, we die, we die, so that lives Palestine or any other country, they will say, we live, we live, so that lives Palestine and the world. It should be a culture of life and hope, not a culture of death and despair. And so that's why, I guess, all the work we try to do is building these possibilities, creating these exchanges, building possibilities where our children can meet and interact and can tour and meet with others, hosting people who can come. We have a lot of people coming, religious groups from churches, even Jewish groups coming to our world. Few Muslim groups come to Palestine and to our world. And we had the chance to meet with other brothers and sisters from United Muslim Relief volunteering abroad group who came and shared with us. And it was really the first time we have a Muslim American group coming and volunteering and sharing 
almost a week with us. And the joy, I guess they can talk about, that the people had in hosting them and meeting with them and exchanging with them was enormous. It's important to keep this link and this possibility that we are not forgotten in all what you live as well. And that when you think of Palestine, think of how people are resisting this ethnic cleansing and they resist not only for their sake, but for all the sake of Muslims and Arabs. And that the protection of the holy sites is an act of resistance. And despite all this work to push people to leave, we resist. Despite all this work to erase the memory, we keep this memory alive. And despite all this effort for continuing a system of apartheid, we say we cannot get used to occupation or oppression or apartheid and say we are fine with it. I am, because it's a bit political, <laughs> Let me say I am speaking in my name. I am not speaking on behalf of United Muslim Relief or Adam Center. So this is my story, this is my talk. I'm not representing United Muslim Relief or Adam Center. So that's why I guess all the efforts we try to do is give possibilities and opportunities. And of course we are an independent organization, so we are not affiliated to any political party though it will mean you will have no money from anybody. And the essence of it that we work with everybody, but not under the umbrella of anybody. For me, every Palestinian is Palestinian, whether he is Hamas or Fatah or Popular Front or whatever, whether he is a Muslim or a Christian or even a Jewish Palestinian. Because Palestinians, like other countries, have their Jews as well, not those who are imported from the United States or Russia or Eastern Europe. So Palestine has always lived in this multiplicity and diversity and respected its people and this diversity that we have lived in. But with all the pain, sympathy and empathy to Jews and their suffering, we cannot pay for the crimes of the Nazis or Europe and say we are fine with it. We cannot accept to repair an injustice by another injustice. And we cannot accept this washing of the European crimes against the Jews or anybody else and say Jesus alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam was born in Palestine, so we'll turn our cheeks to every clap from anybody and say we are fine with it. We are not fine with injustice. We are not fine with occupation. We are not fine with oppression. We are not fine that our children die. We are not fine that our children imprison. We are not fine that our children lose hope in their struggle, in their humanity, in others. We are not fine that people think that the only way to change anything is to die. We are not fine that we walk in the funerals of our children. We are not fine that everybody remains silent and close their eyes and ears and say we can't do anything or it's too complicated or it's hopeless. We are not fine because we do not have this luxury of despair and we cannot just wait for miracles to happen. We need to provoke them to happen. And we cannot just sit down and complain that everything is bad and it's always the fault of someone else. Or we can't do anything, but Monsieur Obama will do it. Or the Pope, or the President, this or the President, that. Or even Allah. Even Allah will not help those who do not help themselves. And in Allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim. So we have to do our part. We have to be role models for all these young people because we want to be proud of what they become. And we want to be proud also of ourselves what, he ha what we have provided for them to be proud of. What are we doing and who are we and what change we want to make in this world and what wa change we want to see in one year, 10 years, 50 years, inshallah, Rabbna yaatikul 
this is a strong belief that we can do better than what is happening and what is going on. And that's why I guess my tour here partly is to seek possibilities of exchange, building relations, remind in whatever way I can that you are important, that you do matter, and that you are not just numbers in this country, and that you can make a change, and you can make a difference. Every single one of us has the potential to be a change maker and make a difference. So we cannot just wait for things to happen or to change because they will not if we do not seek this change. I will stop here and because I wanted to give you time to ask if you would like and eventually I don't know what you have see, shown. <laughs> so I'll, I'll stop here and uh, I'll give possibilities for if you want to ask questions and, and so on. Just a quick question. I'm just curious. Uh, two questions. One, since you said you've been in France, you started there, you traveled this country, how do you compare the state of mind of Palestinian kids at a younger age with European kids in this country? Yeah. You know, how do you uh, so, so you have the, the question of since I lived nine years in France, how do I compare the life and what the children in France live and our children live? How, what the mentality in growing up? Well, paradoxically, children are children. And when you put them together, they say almost the same interest, partly because there is all these satellite channels and people are having the possibility to mix and look at differences. But fundamentally, you have children who are living in freedom and you are children who live under occupation. You have children that go to school as a normal act and you have children in Palestine who go to school as an act of resistance to go to school to. In Hebron, children are put on the street by the Israeli soldiers so that sometimes the teachers make the class in the street because they can't reach their school. Children maybe think of how they can reach the school today. Children in France would think how to go to party tonight. Children in Palestine and their parents think how they can educate their children and be proud of them. Children in France may think of education, but may think, well, I can work and do other things, have fun, go to cinema, and so on. Different challenges for different people. And even in France, when you go, when we went, and in Paris, in the 18th arrondissement, for example, which is mostly immigrant communities. Also, like our kids said about Louisville, Kentucky, they said about Paris 18th arrondissement, that they are poorer than us. So we have challenges in these countries. There is marginalization of certain populations in for children in France. There is uh, different injustices in different countries and people are fighting for their rights in one way or the other. But the essential thing is that wherever you go, when you put, when we had our children playing with other American children, Afro-American children, French children, even Jewish children in the United States or whatever, they are children and they have fun and they play, and even if they don't speak the languages, they manage to make their own world, which is different from us adults in a way. They have their creative way to make a better world. The essence of it is that to keep this beauty growing and not to kill it since the beginning because of these impossibilities for people to meet, interact, and connect, and looking at each other as equally human beings.
Other questions? What kinds of jobs do these children have after they get educated? What kinds of jobs children have after they finish education? Um, in our programs, we had seen children. Now, alhamdulillah, we celebrate this month our 16th anniversary. We have children who started with us when they were five, six years old, 12 years old, 10 years old, and so on. We have children who graduated and as doctors, dentists, uh, lawyers. My assistant, Ray Bal, is, has finished his lawyer degree in, two years ago and he is a theater actor and a trainer and, and work with me. Some of these young people became board members. The Images for Life program, which is a photo and video training program, but also a journalism training program for uh, uh, journalists. So some of these young people work on local media, TVs, radios, uh, with news agencies, international even, with Reuters and, and France Press and so on. Uh, some of these young people have created their own programs and their own organizations and so on. So uh, despite the difficulties, I mean, there is lack of possibilities for work. People work in administration, people work in uh, UNRWA or Palestinian Authority or entrepreneurs on their own. Some people find work in their specialty after they finished their education, but mostly not, unfortunately. Uh, so sometimes they work in any work that is available. And some are so proud that they do not want to work in any kind of work except their specialty. So we have different possibilities. But mostly uh, people try to live. And so if even the, the, the work, their specialty, when I came back to Palestine, for example, with even my PhD in biological and medical engineering, the first three months, I was working with $250 per month. Alhamdulillah, later on, it became $3,000. <laughs> but when I started, it was, I wanted to work. And I wanted to work in my specialty, in a Palestinian pharmaceutical company, and so on. So it started with this. So we are not very picky most of the time. We take the possibilities to live decently, and not to big from anybody, as of him. This young man. With the education in, um, in Bethlehem, would it be rated the same as here in the States? I guess on the level of university, yes. We follow the American system, so we have a bachelor degree at the university, the first grade, uh, the first diploma. And so usually there is no problem of equivalency when Palestinians come to follow up their master and, and PhD education. Within local schools, it varies. One of the things I'm trying to hopefully build in the future with a kindergarten and school to make this system of education inclusive and comprehensive. And what I mean by that is having differently able children integrated within the same education as the other children, so that we do not have children with disabilities aside, whether it's uh, deaf mute or uh, blind children. Because for me, difference, again, is an enrichment. As, as children learn English or hear Arabic or French, they can learn also sign language. They can learn also Brill and, and so on. So these differences could be an enrichment where they can benefit and build a more homogeneous community which does not marginalize those who are different. Because it's, I mean, we have no responsibility of the differences we have. And so that's why every difference is an enrichment for me. And that's why education could, should not be oriented toward dictation and memorization and, as I said, knowing all the answers but don't know how to ask a question. So there is still a challenge within the educational system because you have 40 to 50 children within the same classroom 
teachers do not have much time to have time for each student, so it's very challenging. Okay. Okay. Dr. Well, Dr. Inshallah, we'll break for Salah now, and we'll continue with the Q&A after Salah, Inshallah. So for those that remain afterwards, we'll continue with the Q&A. So we'll break for that. We'll go ahead and break the operation. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar.